And it is said that the first person who emigrated uh, to Medina uh, was Abu Salama uh, ibn Abd al-Asad. Abu Salama, the husband of Umm Salama. Umm Salama is going to become one of the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu later on. Of course, at this time, she is married to Abu Salama. Abu Salama was not from the Quraysh. Umm Salama was from the Quraysh. Abu Salama had been one of the few, uh, this was known at the time, it wasn't common, but it was there, that sometimes a man would leave his tribe and go live with the tribe of his wife. Right? And that also is referenced in the hadith, وَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى دُنْيَا يُصِيبُهَا أَوْ إِمْرَأَةٍ يَنْكِحُهَا فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى مَا هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِ The famous hadith, right? That if a man makes hijrah for the sake of a woman, then his hijrah is for the sake of the woman, it's not for Allah. That's the reference here, that people did have this notion that sometimes the man would adopt the tribe of the wife. So Abu Salama was one of such Arabs, that he was an Arab, he was a free man, a noble man, but he was not a Qurayshi. And he had married Umm Salama from the Quraysh. So he had moved to Mecca. When the persecution increased, he was not a blood Qurayshi, so he was persecuted more. So he left with his wife Umm Salama to Abyssinia. Then when the rumor spread that the conversion took place, remember the satanic verses story said, they returned back and they decided to stay. Rather than go back, they decided to stay. Right? So Abu Salama, Umm Salama are, are of the few who are called those who made both hijras. They made both, because you see the bulk of those who emigrated to Abyssinia, from Abyssinia they went directly to Dar al-Islam Medina. Right? That's, that's majority. Very few of them, and Umm Salama is one of them, and Abu Salama is one of them. They did two hijras for the sake of Allah, and they are called the people of the two hijras. Because they emigrated both to Abyssinia, then they came back to Mecca, and then they emigrated again to Medina. Right, so that's two hijras, this is Abu Salama. So the first person to emigrate, it is said, was Abu Salama. And Abu Salama gathered his belongings, took his stuff, he put his wife, and he had one child at the time, put them on his camel, and... Uh, he made his way out, and he was the first, so he didn't do this secretly. He thought, this is my business, I can take whatever I want, right? That that's why, uh, this was one of the reasons why people started migrating secretly, because of this story. So Abu Salama didn't do this secretly. He just, you know, packed his bags, everybody knew he's about to leave, the news spreads amongst the people, so when he leaves, the Quraysh come and confront him with their, with their weapons. And they said, oh Abu Salama, where do you think you're going? He says, I'm going to Yathrib. What business is it of yours? I have a free man, I'm allowed to go. So they said, as for you, we have no right. Okay, you're not, we, we renounce your Qurashi lini. Khalas, you're not a Qurashi. Take her passport back, khalas, basically, you know. Retract your passport. As for your wife, she is ours. She's a Qurashi. And we will not let you take her or her son because he is our son now. This is pure dhulm. Not that they have any interest in Umm Salam. It's just pure dhulm. You know, and so they forced him to leave his wife and child, and they expelled him without anything. So he thought he's going to go with the family, and everything is taken from him, including his wife and his 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 son. And he has forced to basically flee to Medina on his own. When Abu Salama's tribe found out that he had been treated this way, their jahiliyyah got the better of them as well. And they marched to the Quraysh and they said, As for the lady, she's yours. But this boy is ours. <laughs> and they took the boy. And the Quraysh held on as well to the boy. This was, we know very little details, obviously it's being described in some graphic terms here. But they picked up the boy to take him. And the Quraysh held on and it became a tug of war with a two-year-old. Until his hand was dislocated. And Umm Salama cried out that let them take the boy. Because it's her son going to be killed now basically. I mean you know, tug of war. This is all jahili. Not that they care but it's again a matter of prestige. And you know we call it in the nose you know. The, uh, the issue of being arrogant. This is my, how, how dare you do this to, to, our, to our son. You know, this is our son. So Abu Salama's tribe took the baby. Umm Salama is left with the Quraysh and Abu Salama goes to Medina. And Umm Salama is narrating the story herself. She said, for more than 16 months, every day, year and a half, I would go to al Batha, which is uh, the farthest place outside of Mecca that is still within view of the city. 
right? Crying in the desert because that's where her child and her son have, and her, her husband have gone, right? Crying every day, not able to do anything because subhanAllah, you can imagine, she's a young mother, you know, she's lost her baby boy, she's lost her husband, and she cannot live and function normally. Every day I would be going, crying to the desert until finally some of my uh, cousins had sympathy on me and they came and they begged the elders Here's on the Banu Makhzum. Uh, they beg the elders to, what do you have to do? She's just a lady. She wants to go with her husband and child. Let her go. So after a year and a half, they let her go. She went to the, uh, the, the tribe of her husband. And by this time as well, tempers had calmed down. So they gave back the, her the boy. And so she took the boy and she just walked into the desert, putting her trust in Allah that I need to get to Medina somehow. Right? How is she going to go to Medina? She has no, she doesn't know anything. I mean, she, but she, what else is she going to do? But Allah Azza wa Jal saves such people. I mean, when you have such tawakkun in Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, saves such people. And so she says that by the time I got to Tan'im, you know, Masjid Aisha, Tan'im, that's the outside of Mecca where we go. By the time I got to uh, Tan'im, there I met uh, Talha. Uh, Talha. Uh, Uthman ibn Talha, excuse me, Uthman ibn Talha. And Uthman ibn Talha is from the Quraysh. He's one of the young men of the Quraysh. And he's not a Muslim at this time. I met Uthman ibn Talha coming back from one of his expeditions. Maybe he went hunting, something. And he's coming back. He sees me all alone at Tan'im, which is way beyond what you can see from the city. This is dangerous for a woman to be alone. You understand that she's a young lady, she has her young son here, you know, uh, wolves, uh, la uh, 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 prey, uh, animals of prey, uh, of obviously evil people, she's all alone. So, so Uthman says, what are you doing? So she says, I'm going to my husband, Abu Salama. So he says, you're all alone. He says, I have no one, I, I have Allah Azza wa Jal. So Uthman says, Wallahi, this will not be. I will take you. And so Uthman, Umm Salama says, that I don't think there is any more noble gentleman amongst all of the Arabs than Uthman. I don't think there's any more noble gentleman than Uthman. He walked the entire way and he led the camel with his hand. He's walking from Mecca to Medina and he didn't say a word to me but when it was time to stop he would tell the camel to come down and he would go forward and turn his back on me. Because she's a woman, she has to come out, it might something might show, her leg might show something, turn his back on me. When I would get down, he would put me under the tree, let me sleep, and he would sleep by the camel. And then in the morning I would get back on the camel and we proceeded this way. All the way from Mecca to Medina until finally when I could see the, uh, the, the houses of Yathra basically, uh, he said, your husband is over there and he then let me go uh, on the camel. This is Uthman ibn Talha, right? Not even a Muslim, but his honor, and he's a young man as well at this time. His honor and his, his, his gentleman, if you like, qualities, right? They're shining, how can I let this lady and her young child go? And well, I imagine, I mean, would we have done even a fraction? Yani from Mecca to Medina, walking, walking. This is at least a two-week journey. One way. On the way back, he doesn't even have a camel. Doesn't even have a camel. Right? Uthman ibn Talha. Who is Uthman ibn Talha? No doubt Allah Azza wa will reward him, right? No doubt. I mean, you cannot, even he's a pagan by the way. Even he's a pagan. But still, there's some type of karam, some type of akhlaq. Do you know who Uthman ibn Talha is? Well, firstly, he converted the very last batch before the conquest of Mecca. Allah gave him that honor. Along with Khalid ibn Walid and Amr ibn As. There were three people who converted the very last batch of converts before the conquest, right? And that gave them an honor because Allah says in the Quran, not equal are those who converted before the conquest versus those who converted after, right? لا يستوي منكم من أنفق من قبل الفتح وقاتل أولئك أعظم درجة They have a higher level. So the last batch was Uthman ibn Talha. And then in the conquest of Mecca, when Mecca is conquered, the Prophet is handing out the prizes, if you like, the big prizes of the Kaaba. What are the prizes? Who will get to have what is called the Siqaya? Siqaya means the right to give the, 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 the water. Who will get the right to uh, the keys of the Kaaba? Who will get everything? So Abbas was given the Siqaya. Abbas was given the right to feed the, the, the pilgrims. It's a very big privilege, right? He says, O Messenger of Allah, give me the keys as well. I want both. 
Give me the keys as well. Right? And at this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed that in Allah ya'murukum an tu'addu al-amanati ila ahliha. Allah commands you to give the amana to those who deserve it. So the Prophet gave the key to Ali ibn Abi Talib and he said, Go give this to Uthman ibn Talha. And it shall be with him and amongst his descendants until the day of judgment. And anybody who tries to take it from him will be a zalim. So Ali went and gave it to Uthman ibn Talha. Uthman said, I thought that you guys were getting it, the Bani Hashim. Because the news has spread that they want it, right? And so uh, Ali said, Allah revealed in the Quran this about you. Allah revealed in the Quran basically that we need to give the keys over to you. The Prophet gave it to Uthman ibn Talha. Can you believe for the last 14 and a half centuries it has been amongst his descendants? To this day, to this day, the keeper of the keys of the Kaaba is from the descendants of Uthman ibn Talha. Because this is something. Again, Allah will reward. You know, you do something for... And even though, subhanAllah, he wasn't even a Muslim at the time. But still, there was a sense of honor. And, and who did he do this to? Someone who was going to become our mother. This is Umm Salama. Right? This is not just any Sahabiya. Someone is about to become our mother. He didn't know it. Nobody knew this at the time. She's married to Abu Salama. Abu Salama dies and then the Prophet marries Umm Salama. Right? She becomes our mother. Showing respect to her. Still as a pagan. Yet Allah Azza wa Jal will give that blessing to him. The keys of the Kaaba to this day are in the hands of the descendants of Uthman ibn uh, Talha. 